um, there's a couple of things about this particular session that I especially like. One of them is that when I was a, a freshman in college, and that was when dirt was young, um, the uh, most mind-expanding course I remember taking was a survey of human prehistory. And it covered a lot of these things, but Al has covered some uh, information and knowledge that has come to light since those many years ago. Um, and the other th thing I like is that this is not Al's specialty. He was a forestry guy. And I like it that people, there are a lot of people here who plunge deeply into a subject and got advanced degrees and so on, but have also had their interest captured by something that was outside their specialized field. And this is um, not something that Al studied in graduate school, um, but he, he found some fascinating facts about our way, way, way back ancestors, and uh, we'll hear from him now. Thanks, Al. Okay, thanks, Karen. Yeah, it's been fun digging back into stuff I never knew about. Uh, my original intention was to kind of progress through time in a very regular way. But then I got into some of these things and I found, well, they started way back, but they have uh, evolved on into modern times. And it's kind of fun to trace them on into modern times. So today uh, I'm going to cover the compass and timekeeping and their importance for navigation, as well as paper, <coughs> printing, and the beginning use of metals. And I'll stop on metals when we get into uh, steel, some of the early steel. Well, to start to find your way out in the ocean, you need some help. You know, what direction are you going and where the heck are we? Early on, sailors could find uh, their direction by looking at Polaris, the North, North Star, which lines up almost perfectly with the Earth's uh, geographic pole. And uh, they could also find latitude by shooting that with the sextant, because your angle from that tells you exactly what latitude you're at. South of the equator, uh, things are a little more complicated. They use the Southern Cross and you could still find their direction. They needed some way when it was all folded up, cloudy, to see, okay, which way's north? And lodestone became the, the secret, lodestone and magnetic mineral. And uh, nearly 3,000 years ago, the Greek philosopher Thales of Miletus, I guess that's correct, discovered that lodestone would attract iron. And about 100 years later, the Chinese were also working with lodestone. And about this time, if you can cut the lights, we, uh, the Chinese developed the uh, magnetic spoon. And it made out of lodestone, but they put it on a smooth plate. And it was invariably quite oriented in the south direction. About this time, they may also have developed the magnetic compass. <clears throat> and uh, that was probably about uh, 10 or 11, 100 years ago. And the Europeans followed in the uh, late 18, right? The Europeans followed in the late 1100s. In a uh, magnetic compass, the needle points to magnetic north rather than true north. And this difference up here, the mariners call variation on land, they call it declination. But when I was a student here, that was about 22 degrees east. And now it's only about 15 degrees east. So interestingly, uh, the Earth's magnetic pole has been moving around and it's going faster now than it used to. It's now going about 30 miles a year. It used to go only about six miles per year. Yeah. Compass can uh, guide the direction you're going, but really can't tell you where you are. So uh, let's step back a little bit and look at timekeeping and how people began keeping time. 
uh, people as diverse as the Babylonians, Egyptians, Greeks, and Chinese in the Old World, and the Mayans, Aztecs, and Anasazi in the New World, use some pretty sophisticated celestial observations to tell what time of year it is. The cuneiform tablets, uh, some of them going back 4,000 years, show that the Babylonians were keeping track of various astronomical things, including one that showed uh, the uh, rise of Venus. And uh, this one is much more recent, taken about uh, the year 163, but recording the observations of Halley's Comet. So these folks were doing some interesting stuff. The Egyptians had a calendar of 12 months, of about 30 days each, and they had a way of adding in five days to get to approximately a correct year. And each period of 10 days was marked by the appearance of certain constellations in the sky. And at the time of uh, Sirius rising, when the uh, Nile was flooding, it was very important for their agriculture. By uh, the planet Pleiades was uh, going. I've got them mixed up here. Okay. The Aztec calendar goes back a long time. And uh, it had two periods, one about 20 days, which was for very ceremonial events, but it also had a 365-day period. But the Earth's uh, rotation is such, or its orbit around the sun, that our year is actually a bit more than 365 days. And so this is where they uh, synchronized it. Originally, they thought they did it with the uh, planet Pleiades when it first appeared. It's time to reset the calendar. And now they use a different way because uh, the Earth's precession is changing the tilt, it's throwing that off. So here are the Pleiades. Uh, does anybody here drive a Honda? Any hundreds? Yeah, at least one out there. Well, did you know that the logo <laughs> in Japanese is the same word as Pleiades? And as you can see, it's uh, patterned after the constellation Pleiades. In our southwest, in the Kiva uh, and Casa Rincanada, which um, is about a thousand years back. There's a window in one wall and a second window in another. And as the sun comes through, it shines on very specific niches in another wall. They know what time of the year it is. There's another uh, relic in uh, Chaco Canyon in our southwest. There's a line of parallel rocks up on a, a mountain and it creates a dagger of light that shines on a spiral uh, form on a cliff uh, clear away from it. And uh, at the uh, Bernal Equinox, actually each Equinox, this dagger of light rests on that uh, spiral for about 20 minutes. A sundial from ancient Egypt was just a stick in the ground and uh, things are divided into 12 uh, items around the circle, and they can get roughly the time of day from that. Uh, problem was that uh, time was not very regular, so an hour could be 40 minutes at one time of the year and 80 minutes at another time of the year. Before the coming of the railroads in the U.S. in the 1840s, we were still keeping time with sundials, which really startled me. I assumed, no, no, we had some sort of clocks by then. And we had local time. There was no uh, 24 recognized standard time zones. <coughs> but they timed the railroads and other things uh, using sundials. They even set their clocks by using a sundial because the clocks of the time weren't very accurate. 
But the water, uh, water clock was much more precise than the sundial. And the oldest known one is uh, the Egyptian, uh, Egyptian water clock of uh, Karnak. It dates to about 3,500 years ago. And such clocks were poles that were allowed to have water leaking out of them. And by how much water it leaked, you could tell what time of it had passed. And uh, some of the later ones were even graduated, so you could tell more precisely how much time it had left. <coughs> the hourglass was developed in uh, Europe about uh, a thousand years ago, and was one of the uh, few methods of telling time at sea. And uh, they, many of them were designed to uh, go for four hours, which is about the watch of a sailor at that time. And so when four hours had gone, you turn it upside down and then start moving sand the other way. Well, Leonardo da Vinci, back in the 1490s, and then Galileo in 1582 were interested in pendulums. And Galileo had discovered that the period of a pendulum swinging depends on its length not its weight. And somebody got a hold of that and realized, oh, that's a way to develop a clock that will be very precise. And so pendulum clocks were the, uh, the most accurate uh, timekeeping devices for many, many years. But they weren't any good at sea because the rocking of the ship would mess up the swinging of the pendulum. So uh, in 1707, after four ships were wrecked because of navigational errors, the uh, British government offered a prize of 20,000 pounds, which is now millions of pounds, for uh, the first person who could develop a clock <coughs> that would allow latitude to be determined within 50 kilometers, it's 31 miles. 1762, uh, John Harrison, a carpenter, amateur clock maker, after years of tinkering, submitted a clock that was three times as accurate as needed to win that prize for longitude. And such clocks are now called chronometers. Harrison's clock used a uh, escapement mechanism, which many of you have seen if you ever took a watch or a clock apart. And that provided the periodicity that they uh, pendulum would have provided. And that was a major component of nearly all watches and clocks for many, many years. In 66, the French uh, Pierre Le Roy created an improved uh, chronometer that had uh, temperature corrected components, and so it was a little more precise. And that was the basis of all chronometers for a long, long time. But now things have shifted. Instead of the uh, swinging of a pendulum or an escapement mechanism, they use a quartz crystal. <clears throat> and with the piezoelectric effect, a tiny charge will set it to vibrating. <laughs> and it vibrates 32,768 times per second. And with the microprocessor, they count this. And when it's gone through that many oscillations, it generates an electric pulse turns on the motor down here, and there it goes. The oscillator is over here, mass produced now. Well, you can imagine what this did to the Swiss watch industry. In a uh, quick trip in uh, 1974, I uh, had an interview with a very interesting guy, would be equivalent to the head of our Sierra Club, and few other uh, agencies, but he said, oh, you know, we Swiss don't have much in the way of uh, resources, so we have to use very little material and a lot of skill to make a product that will be sellable. And the Swiss watch was just ideal for that. Well, when we started mass producing uh, digital watches, that just threw them into disarray. I'm wearing a Casio, 
they paid an outrageous price online of $25 for it. I went through a couple of earlier ones, the first $10 and the next was $16. And that one, I even replaced a, uh, a battery to keep it going and probably lasted me about 20 years. But, uh, I mean, this mass production just really messed up the Swiss. Well, if that's not precise enough for you, there's now an atomic clock in Boulder, Colorado, in the, uh, where is it? Institute of Standards and Technology. And it's expected to have an error of only one second per million years. <laughs> it's fairly precise and it's used for computing uh, atomic interactions and things like that. But now with accurate uh, timekeeping established, we'll move on to some celestial navigation using a very simple but elegant device known as a sextant. And it's about 60 degrees, which is the sixth of a circle, so that's where the name came from. But in this, you look through a partly silver mirror toward the horizon, and then another mirror attached to an arm reflects the sun or some other object, and you move the arm to bring that object down to the horizon, and that gives you the angle it is above the horizon. Well, at a given angle of an object above the horizon, you have to be on a circle somewhere on the Earth, and you could be anywhere on that circle. So that doesn't do you a lot of good, but if you do that, for several stars, then you get to the point where all the circles meet, and that gives you a fix of your precise location, if you know what time of day it is. Kind of an interesting example, when I was in Navy training, we uh, had an exercise to do some star sights and uh, find where the ship was. And one of our members was supposed to go to the ship's chronometer and set his watch by it. So we had the precise time. But he didn't get it quite right. So uh, when we got our fix, it was a really beautiful fix. We had three lines almost in a point. But we were 50 miles inland, and that just didn't work. <laughs> so, uh, you really have to know the time. That's the point that for navigation by the stars, okay. you have to know what time it is. But a lot of the computations had already been worked out. Uh, we had tables that uh, showed uh, which part of that circle we might be on, depending on approximately where we were. And so the, uh, the computations were not terribly complicated, but they were still a bit of a hassle, and I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, you could buy a, a now a device with microchips that would do all that for you. And not terribly expensive, a few hundred dollars. But now, of course, they just use GPS and they disregard all that stuff. So we move on to paper. And uh, paper was uh, preceded by uh, papyrus in Egypt which was made by uh, taking slices from the pith of the papyrus plant, which is a tall reed, and uh, crossing them and then pressing them together. Uh, but because papyrus was available everywhere and grew along the Nile, uh, people began using parchment, animal skins, for some of the early books. And it was also used for diplomas. Does anybody here have a diploma on sheepskin? That uh, parchment or sheepskin was used for decades on into the 50s and 60s. And the last school to finally abandon it was Wabash College three years ago. But you know, it was an interesting tradition, and uh, the early scholars needed to carry their credentials with them. And they could roll up parchment, but they couldn't roll up papyrus and some of the other things. Well, some other cultures had other ways of uh, making something like paper. Uh, yeah, I've got lost for one of the uh, tapa clock. 
came out of southeastern Asia several thousand years ago. And that was made by pounding the bark of certain trees, one of them being a species of other tree, into a kind of a plot. I'd like to go to a timeline for uh, paper. Uh, first sheet of paper was created by a, uh, a member of the Chinese Imperial Court. And he mixed up uh, cloth and mulberry tree stuff and everything into kind of a pulp, made a slurry, and then pressed all the water out of it, and hung it up to dry, and that was the first sheet of paper that anyone knows about. And then in the 1600s, Buddhist monks took the paper to Japan, Korea, Central Asia, India, and by the 700s, uh, the uh, paper was uh, spread into the Middle East, and in the 1200s, it got spread into Europe by way of Baghdad. And for a long time, it was called uh, Baghdadicos. Baghdadicos. The early paper was mostly uh, a slurry of uh, material made from rags, hemp, and so on and made into a pulp and then lifted onto a screen. But uh, back to my timeline, in 1844, some uh, chemical processes were developed that allowed uh, wood to be used to dissolve out the lignin. So wood is a set of fibers held together by lignin. So here we have uh, cellulose fibers bound together by lignin. And we now have uh, sulfite, sulfite processes that are used pretty much for fine paper. And the craft process, which is used for the brown paper we use for wrapping and paper bags, things like that. Now, paper is produced by lifting a layer of uh, pulp, or slurry, onto a screen and then uh, drying it somehow. And the original paper was made one sheet at a time, but now it's made with these huge forger here machines. It will create a piece of paper several feet wide and run it off at several hundred feet per minute, rolling it on the great rollers. So the process, you have a wet end here where a screen is going through a vat of uh, slurry and picking up a layer of, of uh, material and then that goes through rollers that press out most of the moisture and then it runs through a bunch of hot rollers to dry it out and then it goes to the calendar end which again is where it gets rolled into these giant rolls very fast <clears throat> so now on to printing as some way it was needed early on to uh, impress clay or paper or something with symbols that uh, could be repeated. And this was done one character at a time. But then, way back, the Chinese uh, developed woodblock printing in the seventh century. And you can imagine how much labor it took to carve a page of print on a block of wood. So the Chinese, being fairly clever, decided that they'd uh, develop movable type. So you just could rearrange the type and you didn't have to start from scratch each time. And to print something, you simply pressed a sheet of paper against the type. <clears throat> and Gutenberg, uh, 1440, developed the first uh, printing press for mass producing things. And uh, they used movable type, carved from the Chinese, and uh, created with a hand mold where you poured uh, molten metal into a mold for each individual character. And uh, that began the basis for doing this. With that, he could print up to 300 pages per day which was a huge increase and really kicked off the distribution of books all over the world. Well, interestingly, uh, apprentices, 
printer's apprentice, I was sometimes coached to look into a tray full of uh, print or uh, type. And it was set up loosely with ink in it and everything, and they'd get the guy really looking closely. And then they'd push the type together and it squirt ink all over his face. Mm -hmm. Kind of an initiatory right from the youngsters. Well, linotype machines were developed in the 1880s, late 1800s, and was a major way of setting up newspapers for about 100 years. I still remember a field trip when I was in grade school, perhaps, in which we went to the local newspaper and looked at their linotype machine and the works. And it would set up uh, lines of print already fused together in slugs and then uh, these were put together. This is uh, just doing a proof for them. But uh, paper mache was pressed against the, uh, the metal print to absorb the, or take up the form, and then metal was poured into the paper mache to create a plate that had all the letters on it, and then that was bent to fit onto a press that could be rolled and mass-produced newspapers. And that uh, lasted for a long, long time. Offset lithography and other forms of computerized uh, printing are now uh, replacing this all together. And the plate is made by uh, laser inscribing uh, the material and then this is put on a drum and rotated against ink rollers, which pushes ink into the, the type slots or grooves. And then that is rolled against another drum that has a blanket that picks up the pattern. And this is then uh, rolled against the paper. And all of this uh, transfers it from that original plate onto the paper. And it looks pretty crude, but it's precise. And for color printing, they use four different colors and do this for each of them, all on the same paper. And get the register is just right, so it comes out beautifully. You can't imagine that it's done with four different items. So, on the metals. The using metals uh, goes back uh, into the Stone Age, and uh, both copper and gold occur in metallic form in nature and began being used uh, first as ornaments for sure, uh, for gold and uh, copper also. Uh, the, uh, there's a copper pennant discovered in what's now northern Iraq dated to 11,000 years ago. And copper also early on began being used in uh, coins. This is a chunk of uh, copper with the, the mineral and the natural copper all mixed in. A very coin. About 8,000 years ago, uh, copper began being used for implements in the old world. And early coppersmiths must have learned quite a bit. They found that if they hammered copper, it got stronger, tougher. If they heated it, it annealed it and got softer and more workable. They didn't realize it, but they were rearranging the molecular structure, which is now the whole basis for all kinds of alloys, the high temperature alloys for jet engines and everything else imaginable, all by rearranging the molecular structure. But copper was also being used in the new world, and uh, some of us have this sort of uh, Euro centric bias and all. Those natives couldn't do anything. But uh, in the Great Lakes area, about 9,500 years ago, Native Americans were using copper. And the oldest uh, reliably dated object from that period is uh, this spear point that's 8,500 uh, years ago. They uh, were able to establish these things by uh, 
improved carbon dating methods. They found that there were still uh, wood and cordage attached to some of the ancient spear points. And so they had the material to date these. But they also found mining sites. They weren't smelting sites yet, but mining sites where they were extracting it. And from the charcoal and so on, they also could get some good carbon dates. <clears throat> these are some of the objects. Uh, if we uh, translate these, they're, uh, no, where's my numbers? Anyway, there's now evidence of copper smelting in the Great Lakes area. These are some of the early implements, even uh, fish hooks and knife blades and so on. But uh, to find the date of copper smelting, they found that if you are heating uh, copper minerals, not only the copper, but also lead melts out, and some of it gets volatilized and spread out across the landscape and into lakes. And lake sediments will form layers that can be dated year by year, just almost the same as tree rings. And so they found that uh, the lead content of the lake sediments peaked about 6,000 years ago. And the archaeological evidence, they don't know quite why, but uh, copper used by uh, North Americans uh, started about 9,000 years ago and then peaked about five or 6,000 years ago and then began declining. And uh, they think partly because it was just as easy, maybe easier, to make the tools you needed out of bone than out of copper. And there may have been some results of climate change and so on. So some of the early implements made. Uh, actually, uh, if you mix uh, copper with arsenic, which I never thought of as a metal, but you get bronze. And uh, even the uh, Aztecs were making bronze. It may have been an accidental because there was often uh, arsenic metals mixed in with the copper. And when you melt, melted this stuff out, sort of accidentally you had bronze. And they probably figured out oh, that's a pretty good batch of copper, a little bit harder than the rest of us did. But the early furnaces could only uh, developed sort of a copper-rich slag that had to be further refined. But then they started uh, using furnaces with bellows. And you can see the bellows over here. This is a modern replication, I'm sure. And I always wondered why, when you blow on a fire, does it get a lot hotter? And you know, I finally figured out, well, it's something burning probably has a layer of inert gases, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide around it. It keep more, keeps more oxygen from getting in there. If you blow all those away, you get a good supply of oxygen, it gets really hot. So if you go back to my first effort of how they were blowing on a little bundle of tinder to get it going, why that was part of the process. Well, the earliest forge, Ford, goes back to uh, Israel uh, about 6,500 years ago. I might also mention that uh, the uh, people in the Andes were also using gold uh, really in quite sophisticated ways. Well, bronze was uh, assumed that Bronze Age started about 5,000 years ago, and that was about 700 years after copper began being used. And it was harder and it was easier to cast than copper, so it became quite popular for bronze implements, tools, weapons, so on. Well, the Bronze Age lasted for over 2,000 years ago. <laughs> bronze Age had lasted for over 2,000 years in the Mediterranean and a good deal later in uh, parts of Europe, particularly Northwestern Europe. But then the Iron Age came in. Started between 3,200 and 2,600 years ago among people across much of Asia and parts of Africa. They began making tools and even weapons out of iron. And things were pretty much the same until the uh, 
late 1800s when uh, a guy named Bessemer, a, a British engineer, uh, developed things that led him to the Bessemer furnace, which would uh, take molten pig iron and mix it with carbon and so on and become steel. That was the first process to really mass produce steel. So the quality of steel varied a good deal with carbon content. If not enough carbon, it wasn't hard. Uh, too much, it got brittle. And China was the first to produce really high quality steel, probably about 2,300 years ago. And apparently used processes somewhat similar to the Bessemer furnace. But for the Western world, it was uh, Bessemer who got the, the Bessemer furnace going and is considered the father of steel. Well, I want to end with a timeline for uh, Battles. The earliest evidence of rock labor, native copper came out of the Middle East. Okay. And rock means hammer rather than cast. And then uh, 9,500 years ago, beginning use of copper by Native Americans, Great Lakes area. And copper used for tools in the old world about 8,000 years ago. And experimenting with copper smelting. Uh, roughly 7,000 years ago in the Great Lakes, 5,000 years ago in the Middle East. And then the Bronze Age developed four to 5,000 years ago in the Far East. And the Iron Age, uh, with wrought iron, again hammered instead of cast, in the Middle East, and I kind of missed uh, Africa. But it's about the same time, uh, Newer archaeological dating is finding that the Africans were uh, using wrought iron way, way back. Again, kind of uh, against our Eurocentric biases. And then cast iron uh, developed in China about 2,600 years ago and introduced to Europe uh, 550, 800 years ago. And uh, then they began using coke instead of uh, uh, wood and charcoal, which were getting pretty scarce about 300 years uh, about uh, 300 years back. Uh, and then I mentioned the Bessemer furnace. And then kind of the latest thing uh, is electrolytic refining of aluminum. And uh, that sort of rang bells in my memory because uh, I think it, in the U.S. developed it uh, somewhere in Ohio. Some of my Ohio relatives sort of bragged about aluminum being started there. But it was also going on in France. So that winds me up if you've got questions or comments. If somebody back there can flip on the lights, so I, uh, we can have any comments. <laughs> Well, is there any evidence that our founding fathers were thinking about or concerned about the quality of the paper that the, uh, they were using for the Constitution would hold up? I have no idea. Anybody else know about that? Interesting question. Is it on paper? Yeah, right now. The paper is more durable than some people's respect for it. <laughs> is the Constitution written on paper? I believe so. Yeah. Could be on parts, but I think it's on paper. I do have a comment. Okay. Okay. Here's one coming ahead. Al, where did you say they got the arsenic to mix with the copper uh, to make bronze? Where did that come from? Well, some of it was uh, just mixed in with the copper minerals, and so they accidentally got it. Uh, beyond that, I don't know to what extent they searched out arsenic and knew where it was. It was mine. And I'm so curious whether some of those early bronzes were toxic. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, 
the Department of Law and printing newspapers and so on. Uh, reminded me of when I was in Japan in the late 60s, and the Japanese typewriters, which had to use a whole 1900 characters, had a whole scroll of the un relatively unused characters, and then a major keyboard that had the, major, the, the more prominent ones, and typing was a very, very onerous job. <laughs> It probably take great skill to use one of those. I may, I may have missed it, but I, did, I didn't know if you uh, emphasized the reason for wanting very accurate timepieces had to do with determinative longitude, navigation. Yeah. The, yeah. Longitude is you could do with the elevation of various stars yeah. or the sun or whatever. Well, but to, to determine longitude, you need a very accurate timepiece. That was the yeah. reason for that. The other question, I have a question. It took awfully long for cast iron to move from China to Europe. Do you have any explanation why it took so long? Really, like a thousand years or something. I have no idea. I guess some of our ancestors were still beating each other with clubs back then. <laughs> Wooden clubs. Oh. Okay, Lowell, and then you. You can give Paul. I think bronze is usually considered to be made of copper and tin, uh, and there may be a little bit of arsenic, but it's copper, tin, and zinc. Uh, if you were doing using arsenic, uh, you would have uh, fumes coming off uh, and arsenic poisoning, so I think that probably that would not be a major industry. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a great approach, but that's where some of the first bronze came from. A short career <laughs> as a bronze maker. Paul is next. Since the earth wobbles, you're talking about timepieces, the earth wobbles, it doesn't have, it goes faster and slower on the distribution of snow and ice and water and other reasons. It, do you know what the present day uh, method of determining a year or a minute is? Well, I mean, we've got these atomic clocks that are pretty precise. So is that the, it is, those are now the measure of a year? Of a year well, of other timepieces, yeah. I mean, they don't use that for most stuff, but, yeah. uh, you know, all kinds of Time pieces now, these quartz crystals and so on are very precise. And if they get off, they can do some astronomical observations and correct them a little bit. Yeah. Correct them against what? Well, if they're wrong. You know, if your Earth, or if your day is coming out to be uh, 365 and 3 eighths days, why well, you got to do something about that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think we're about to up. Okay. Um, I, I have a comment, too, about paper. Um, and this goes back about 20 years. I did a lot of work with uh, court reporters in the King County Superior Court. They had requirements for keeping their court notes uh, for a certain number of years, and I think for criminal cases, they had to keep them for 20 years. The courthouse was getting stacked up in hallways with paper, <laughs> even though they used those narrow strips uh, rather than full-size pages, and they were trying to think of some Thing other than paper, and most of them were using electronic and digital media to actually, and so they're trying to think, oh, well, you know, we have all of this electronic stuff, and they couldn't figure it out, because just think about what kind of electronic storage devices were available 20 years ago. Uh, I remember when floppy disks came in, can you find a place that will read a, a floppy disk now? <laughs> because it changed so many times, they ended up with good old paper that we've had for thousands of years because nobody has figured out anything more durable for keeping long-term records interesting. Yeah. 
well, a comment on that, that uh, institutions often uh, don't have the skills needed to do what they need to do. So our uh, air traffic control systems used to be using computers from, I don't know, the 1950s or something. They're not nearly up to date. And apparently it's very hard to uh, take a massive institution like that and get them up to date with modern equipment. Ooh. Yeah, turn, in, turn an oil tanker. <laughs> it's kind of like that. I think we're done. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. No Saturday, no Saturday.